This is the Panther. It is regarded by many as one of the most advanced and technologically superior tanks of World War II. In this video, we're going to have a look inside and out. We're going to look at the crew positions, the technology, and also we're going to try and compare it to some of the tanks it faced, things like the Sherman and the T-34. This video has been made possible by our supporters on Patreon, our YouTube members, and our super thanks donors. Please join them if you can and support the Tank Museum. And thanks for watching. From a production run of around 6,000, there aren't many Panthers left. But this one is actually quite unusual because this one wasn't built by the Germans. This tank was built by the British Army. As you can see from the plaque welded to the front armour, this Panther was built by the British Army's Royal Electrical and Mechanical Engineers in 1945. But why? Because the Panther was seen as one of the most technologically advanced tanks of World War II, examples were wanted for evaluation. So in August 1945, the RIMI, Royal Electrical and Mechanical Engineers, received orders to build as many Panthers as they could for evaluation. The city of Hanover was in the British zone of occupation, and it was home to one of the major Panther and Jag Panther assembly plants. From here, the Remi workshop unit salvaged enough parts to construct nine Panthers and 12 Jag Panthers with the assistance of former factory workers. Once built, the Panthers were put through the standard British Army acceptance trial to see what they could do. The results were very disappointing. The two Panthers on trial failed to complete the course, and most of the rest had to be cannibalized for parts. The 1948 report states that very little information of any value was obtained, owing to the general unreliability of the Panther and Jag Panther tanks. So how did this tank, that wouldn't pass a basic British Army acceptance trial, get the reputation of being one of the best tanks to see combat during World War II. For the Germans, it needed to be. The Soviet KV-1 and T-34 tanks encountered during Operation Barbarossa in 1941 made challenging adversaries. The T-34 in particular had hugely superior mobility and could knock out Panzer III and Panzer IV tanks at 1,000 metres whereas the short 75mm gun of the Panzer IV was only effective at point-blank range, and the Panzer III's 50mm only a little better. This Panther is an Ausführung G, and that's the final production model after the Ausführung D and Ausführung A. The G was produced from March 1944 through to May 1945, hours obviously a little bit later than that, and it makes up around about half of the total production run of roughly 6,000. The Panther was preceded, of course, by the Panzer III, the Panzer IV, and the Tiger I, but it's very different in appearance. I mean, to begin with, up at the front here, instead of three plates, you've just got one long sloping piece of armor, and that gives it quite an angular appearance. Sloped armor was a design feature that was borrowed from the T-34 with the two benefits that it increases the likelihood of an incoming round ricocheting rather than penetrating, and it increases the thickness of metal that a round flying roughly flat has to get through. The Panther's frontal plate is 80 millimetres of rolled homogenous armour sloped at 55 degrees, and that gives you a line of sight thickness of 139.5 millimetres. And what that means is this can withstand hits from the F-34 gun on T-34 at even very close range. Early Panthers had face-hardened armour. That's easier for construction purposes because it can be more easily cut and formed, but it has limited shock resistance. From the later Asforum D tanks onwards, rolled homogenous armour was being used, and that's tempered throughout its entire thickness, and it gives improved protection. The side armour of the Panther Asforum D and A has a thickness of 40 millimetres inclined backwards at an angle of 50 degrees. That gives you a line of sight thickness 
that's the angle that it would meet an incoming round at, at 62 mil. That is not a great deal. And you tend to find an awful lot of knocked out Panthers have suffered a sponson hit in here. It gets slightly better with the Hasforong G. The armor thickness goes up to 50 mil, and that gives you a line of sight thickness of 78 millimeters. The interlocking construction that you can see here uh, is another innovation, and that adds quite a lot of rigidity and strength to the structure of the hull. But the Panther as a whole is a bit of a departure from typical German tank construction. Up to this point, the upper hull and the lower hull have been built as separate components. With the Panther, they are all one. And you can see this illustrated in the photographs of the bombed out factory, where you've got completed Panther hulls piled up on top of one another. The Panther is a typical German design, so it's rear engined, but the final drive, the sprockets, are at the front. And that means the drive shaft has to pass down the middle of the tank under the turret. And that actually makes it a fair bit taller. Aspects of the T-34 that gave it excellent mobility, Christie suspension, rear wheel drive, and a diesel engine, were dismissed by the Panther's design team at MAN in favour of the usual German torsion bar suspension and a petrol engine, the Maybach HL230, as used on the Tiger. The petrol Maybach engine was a definite mistake. I mean, to begin with, owing to their way of working, they were a specialist engineering firm, Maybach found it difficult to supply spares. So that means there's a lower level of frontline serviceability. It's also very thirsty. This Maybach engine uses four times the fuel of the diesel engine on a T-34, the Kharkov V2. We also have the typical German Schachtlaufwerk uh, assembly of um, overlapping road wheels. That is really good in terms of weight distribution, but it complicates repairs because if anything goes wrong, you have to strip multiple road wheels off to get at it. Um, and they were prone to clog with ice and mud. Here on the back deck, you've got the usual array of uh, louvers, access hatches, ventilators. Uh, it's a weak spot on the tank because the actual armor of the back deck is only 16 millimeters thick. And a British Army report suggested that it was vulnerable to air burst from something like a 25 pounder gun or a 155 mil howitzer. Now that would be a pretty good feat of gunnery to drop an air burst over the back of a target as small as a tank. But to reduce the possibility, the size of these fittings was brought down. This tank is painted to resemble a very late war example. Basically what's happening is they're running out of paint. So what we have is a base coat of red oxide primer and then a disruptive pattern of Dunkelgelb, dark yellow. The gun itself is the Rheinmetall Borsisch 75mm KWK 42L70. A bit of explanation for the non-specialist here. KWK is the abbreviation of Kampfwagen Kanone, tank gun. 42 is the year of its acceptance into production, and L70 is the length of the gun tube measured in calibers. 70 times 75mm equals 5,250. So the tube is 5.25 meters, or just over 17 feet long. Panzergranata 3942 APBC round, which has got a muzzle velocity of 935 meters a second, will penetrate up to 112 millimeters of armor uh, at a range of 1,000 meters. With the Panzergranata 4042, it's an APCR round, that has a muzzle velocity of 1,130 meters a second, and that'll penetrate up to 149 millimeters of armor, angled back at 30 degrees. What that means is this gun could deal with the frontal armor of a T-34 or a Sherman with relative ease. Now, there's no doubt about the fact that this is a very good gun, and it certainly outclasses the F-34 gun on the T-34. But the thing is, is it not significantly better than the KWK-40, which you find on things like the Panzer IV, but is bigger and heavier. It's gonna need 
a wider hull, a bigger turret, and that's going to increase weight and decrease mobility. The mantlet is of a semi-cylindrical shape, and this is a bit of a design flaw. It creates a shot trap. So an incoming round will be deflected underneath and down into the front hull. And there's only 17 mil of armor there. And of course, you've got the bow machine gunner, come radio operator, and the driver sat there. Now, a later version of the mantle, a chinned version, was produced to counteract that, but it's not fitted to this tank. It should be, it's an Asforum G, but of course this is a post-war parts assembly, if you like. Looking at the top of the turret, uh, you've got the ventilator, lifting eyes, uh, there is a periscope fitting for the loader, and then here, this is the commander's cupola. Uh, seven vision blocks, so good situational awareness. And the other thing is the hatch actually opens, slides sideways. Now I think that's a better arrangement than say Soviet tanks where it tends to sort of open upwards. It's less obvious when the hatch is open, although it does take a bit more physical strength to operate. The circular hatch in the back of the turret is useful for bombing up and it enables the loader to dispose of spent brass, and this cuts down the fumes and clutter in the turret when firing. So, here we are inside the turret. It is more spacious than some, but of course the bulk of the front is dominated by the breech of the 75mm gun. Uh, the breech is actually open, you can see the breech block down here. The thing that's missing is the recoil guard, and that would have occupied quite a bit more space out here. So it's effectively cutting the fighting compartment in two. The rear hatch, the circular hatch, is the main entry for the loader and the gunner. And in terms of crew positions, um, the loader is over here. Uh, commander, this is his seat here. And then you've got the gunner with a flap down seat just below the commander. Commander has cast cupola with seven vision blocks excellent all-round vision. Um, it's a vast improvement on a great many tanks. Below him, as I said, is the gunner. Now the gunner has his hand controls here, so that's hand elevation and traverse, uh, and he's also got pedals down below, and that operates the power traverse of the turret, also fires the gun, and fires the coaxial uh, MG34 as well. This is, it's remarkably, it's still here. This is the TSF-12 uh, sight, gun sight. Very, very good piece of optics, that. In theory, you can hit a target up to 3,000 metres away. Although, of course, accuracy goes down at range. Hitting targets at that sort of distance wasn't advised because it's a waste of ammunition. And in this tank, you've only got, say, six, 70, 80 rounds, so you're going to have to be careful where you place them. Um, moving over, you've got the loader's position on this side. Big advantage this tank has over its closest competitor, the T-34, it's got a turret basket. So the crew actually go round with the turret. There's none of that dancing round by the loader trying to find rounds to put in while the, gu the turret actually traverses. On the loader's side, he's got uh, fitting for a periscope. Um, he's also got the, this thing, this fitting in the roof. That's the Nelvertigenswaffe. Uh, that is a very simple um, smoke grenade and signal flare launcher, spring operated with a hinge breech. There's another little refinement here that I've not seen on any other World War II tank. And that's uh, the fact that, imagine you've just fired the gun, breech recoils, case spent brass falls out and actually drops down into this box here. Drops into there and this tube actually evacuates the smoke and muck from the box and pushes it out uh, through the extractor fan on the turret ceiling. Um, so that actually, actually keeps the air uh, reasonably clear. Uh, and pure, which is a big advantage to the tank crew. Another little refinement um, they came up with with the Panther was the fact that they used heat in the radiators to warm the crew compartment. 
Now that might sound like a you know, minor consideration, but if you are in the middle of Russia and it's winter and it's minus 20, 30 degrees outside, it's going to improve your uh, ability to work and fight quite considerably. But it's not just for the cruise benefit. The batteries, wet acid batteries, are actually in here under the floor and keeping them warm improves their performance quite considerably. Looking at the driver and radio operator's positions in front of the tank, both have sub-rectangular hatches and they both got fittings for periscopes. Going inside, the first thing to mention about the driver's position is that unlike Tiger, there's no steering wheel. We've gone back to levers. The second is the reason it all seems so complicated is the controls are duplicated. Now that strikes me as being a very thorough and Germanic solution. And why it is, it's so the driver can use controls from either inside the tank, looking for the periscope, or by raising his seat, drive his head out the hatch. The tank's steered by pulling up on the levers either side of the driver's seat, and those operate pumps which put pressure on the steering brakes. The gear stick is on the driver's right. It's fitted with two triggers. Pulling just the top one enables the driver to engage first. Operating both together gives you sixth, seventh, and reverse. His pedals have the accelerator on the right, clutch on the left, and brake in the middle, with a handbrake over on the driver's left. The driver's instruments are on his right. There's the tachometer and speedometer, and then the ignition key slot and starter button, along with an ammeter, oil gauge, and most importantly, bearing in mind the fact this is a Panther, an engine fire warning light. An American tanker who drove a captured Panther reported it was much easier to drive than our own tanks. On the other side of the transmission housing, we have the Funker, the radio operator's position. I don't believe the comms kit was ever fitted for this vehicle, but production tanks had the FU5 AM radio plus the Caston PZ number 20 intercom for crew communications. AM radio is good in that it requires less power to transmit over distance than FM, but it's also prone to static interference. There's also the ball mount for the Bow MG34. Having gone through all that, I'm left thinking this is a tank with a large amount of refinement and technical sophistication. The question is, how well did it work? The Panther was very much rushed into production. And the result of that was that by the time the first 200 Asfurung Ds were committed to action for Operation Zitadel, the Kursk Offensive in July 1943, there were still a lot of problems that needed ironing out. After two days, fewer than 100 were serviceable, some through enemy action, but a larger number through mechanical breakdown. Throughout the majority of the rest of the war, Panther units struggled to maintain a serviceability rate of more than 35%. Fundamental problems involved the fuel pumps, transmission, and final drives. The fuel pumps were a major source of engine fires, exacerbated in the Asforung D by a rubber waterproof lining to the engine bay, which burnt very nicely. In many ways, the Panther design was a carryover from the MAN VK20 series, replacements for the Panzer III and IV. The running gear and mechanicals were designed for a 24-ton tank, but ended up part of a 45 tonne, putting huge strain on the engine and the transmission. This continued all the way through the Panther's frontline service. And in early 1945, Guderian, as Inspector General de Panzertruppen, reported that there'd been 370 final drive failures in Panthers on the Eastern Front alone. And the crews, slightly unsurprisingly, we're starting to lose confidence. The Panther could be superb. In action near Kharkov in August 1944, a Panther gunner wrote, the action is short but violent. Some T-34s begin to burn. We are favored compared to the T-34 because our armor is thicker and our 75 millimeter guns are very accurate. In the second half of 1943, Panthers accounted for around about 500 T-34s for the loss of approximately a hundred of their own. But more Panthers were being lost through mechanical breakdown than enemy action. 
And the T-34 really did retain the edge in terms of mobility and reliability. Now, some of the basic problems were sorted out as the production run went on, particularly by the time we come to the Asfurung G, but the Panther still remained a fundamentally unreliable tank. It's interesting that the French army, which operated around 50 Panthers from 1946 to 1950, finally managed to iron out enough of the remaining troubles, particularly solving the problem of engine fires. In French service, the Panther achieved a measure of reliability, and it became a substantial influence on post-war French tank design. If you'd like to find out more about the Panther, you'll be interested to know the Tank Museum has produced this, and this is a meticulous, beautifully produced translation of the original Panther Feeble. Panther Feeble was created as an engaging and easy to understand handbook to break the tradition of heavy going technical manuals. Sophisticated machines like this required considerable knowledge to keep them in action. So commanders sought to snag the interest of young tank crews with these light-hearted, well-illustrated handbooks. Based on the original document housed in our archive, this self-published title features English text carefully set over the German original, retaining the rhyming verses and the wit of the authors. It includes inserts from the original book and is printed on identical paper, so you get an authentic feel. To order your copy, visit the Tank Museum online shop or see the link in the description below. Thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, please like and subscribe. And if you can, support us on Patreon.